My name is Mariella and I'm super excited about today's chat. I'm going to learn a lot. I'm really ready to listen to our guest speaker. She's got a lot of knowledge here to share with us. Um, but before we get into uh, our presentation, I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping rules. And if you're just joining us, hello, welcome. Um, right in the chat box where you're calling from so that we can give you a shout out a little later. Um, and then any background noise, uh, any background information that you want to share so that we can keep you in mind as Mary is diving into your questions. And with that said, um, I've muted everyone upon entrance just to avoid any background noise. Um, and, but I do, I'm gonna sound like a broken record by the end of this chat. I would love if everyone could, you know, turn your cameras on um, and come off of mute whenever you wanna share your voice or you wanna add something or you want our guest speaker to dive in deeper. Um, this is not meant to be something where, you know, someone's speaking at you and, and uh, you're joining us live for the hour. So we really, really want to take advantage of, of your presence here. Um, and with that said, if you do come off of mute, you will be uh, featured in our live recording. So this is being recorded um, and I really encourage everyone to be present. I know we're living in a world where everyone is multitasking, uh, but I just really invite everyone to be present with us and then rewatch this live recording on Power to Fly a little later. Um, if you have any sensitive information that you wanna be kept anonymous, uh, please write to me privately. You can find me in the chat box under Mariella. Um, and then last but not least, follow us on social um, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, we have a lot of great chats uh, coming up this month. So we really wanna keep you informed and we wanna see you on the next chat. So um, great, with that said, uh, I will just jump right into introducing our guest speaker. Actually, I'm not gonna introduce you. I would love to hear from you, Mary. Let us know, um, you know, what you're excited to share with us today, how you came to learn about Power to Fly, um, and then we'll jump right into this hour-long chat. Absolutely, and thank you so much for, um, for the wonderful introduction. So my name is Mary Olushoga, and I am founder of AWP Network. AWP stands for African Women Power Network, and I was actually introduced to Power to Fly through my friend Ani. Um, and I'm very excited about this opportunity because like I uh, said to you earlier, I've worked in the small business space since 2007 um, and I've learned a great deal um, and more importantly, trying to figure out ways to support entrepreneurs in a way that they can be more proactive as they're looking for funding, as they're looking for financing, especially during this very difficult time. So even though it's difficult out there and unfortunately so many people are losing their jobs and losing lots of employment opportunities, there are still a significant number of small business owners who are raising funds because of their ability to whether it's tell their stories or because of the type of business that they have. So I'm more than happy to delve more uh, into the conversation and to see how you know I can support you if you're listening in and to answer any questions that you may have. So thank you so much once again for that wonderful introduction. Yes, thank you, Mary. And we're going to get to learn more about you uh, throughout this hour. So feel free to share more about your personal journey, um, any anecdotes, you know, we really value um, being authentic. And I know you're going to bring that to the table. So I just invite all of our live callers to also bring their authenticity. Um, and it's okay to be vulnerable. Again, if anyone has anything that uh, is sensitive, you can message me privately. Um, I'm just going to shout us out here uh, for the folks who have already uh, written in the chat box where they're calling from. So our guest speaker is calling from New York. I'm calling from Buenos Aires. We've got some folks calling from Mexico, Argentina, Ohio, New York State, Algeria, um, Toronto. Awesome. And then um, thank you again for writing a little bit about your background here. I I'll also open this up to everyone else on the line. Feel free to drop in the chat box any background information that you want Mary to consider um, as she's diving in deep here with some of these questions. So um, Akin here has written, uh, she's early stage startup and film production. Awesome. So let us know where you are in your journey of you know starting your business, if you're transitioning, if you're afraid, if you're excited. Um, these are crazy times. So we just really want to take advantage of this hour to to, you know, help support everyone. I should um, also say, Akin is a very good friend of mine. He must have seen this when I posted it on Facebook. <laughs> awesome. yeah, absolutely, I saw that on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. how are you? <laughs> how are you? Good, good. Yeah. Awesome, Akin. Thank you for turning your camera on. And you're calling from <laughs> Toronto, right? Awesome. Toronto, yeah. Great. Okay, so Mary, why don't you just take it away, take us into your presentation, and I'll let you know when we're about halfway through so we can get into some of the questions here, okay? 
Absolutely. So um, this presentation is a presentation that I've given um, to small business owners who are looking for loans. So it's not really about investments, because when you talk about investments, you're talking about some form of equity, right? But when you go for a loan, so th there are different types of funding, which I'll probably delve into. Um, like I said, this presentation was created with the with the audience being small business owners who are looking for loans, really not really investors, because I know a lot of people are out there looking for investors and there are different types of financing opportunities that are available. So when someone's looking for a loan, the person you're borrowing from is not looking for any kind of equity, but they're just looking for you to pay the money back. So that means that your business needs to be sustainable and you need to have cash flow for you to be able to do that. And that's what I'm really focused on. But if you're looking for equity, you know, it could be from family and friends, it could be from private investors, they're looking for a portion of your business, it could be 10%, 15%, whatever it is that is agreed upon. And they're also looking that you pay the money back when you become profitable, right? So a loan is you're returning our money back after six months, but equity or investment is when you become profitable, you know, then you can return our money back. So I just wanted to ensure that there was a clear distinction with that. Uh, next slide, please. So like I said, today's um, objective is to really help you explore your capital needs, the different types of financing that is available, as well as how to proactively look for financing. Um, next slide, please. And these are some of the questions that you need to ask yourself. Um, you know, like I said earlier, it's important that small business owners remain proactive about when they're looking for funding. A lot of people sort of have a very survivalist approach to seeking funding, um, but you really have to be proactive, um, you know, in terms of how much you're looking for, how much you need. There are so many times I, I come across business owners who they're looking for money and then they say, no, you tell me how much I should be applying for. It doesn't work that way. You have to be able to understand your business, assess the needs of your business, figure out how much you need and why you need the money, what you would like to use the money for, um, and then really go forward from there. Next slide, please. And so these are some of the questions that you probably need to ask, you know, in terms of before you approach a lender, what is the opportunity to grow your business? Does your business, you know, make sense in terms of the profitability? Is this a need or a want? Meaning that do you need the, the, the business, the, do you need the financing to grow their business? Are you going to be using it to pay salaries? What exactly are you going to be using the money for? And more importantly, something that it's important to look for, whether you're looking for a loan or whether you're looking for an equity, whether you're looking for someone to purchase equity in your business, is how much have you put in the business? Um, that's also very important to explore. And more importantly, especially if you're a startup, is your idea even feasible? You know, so many people have different types of ideas and people dreamt about their ideas, you know, and all kinds of things. But then more importantly, is it feasible, especially in a post COVID-19 era? Next slide, please. So these are some of the things that you can actually use the money for. People use money for inventory, receivables, working capital needs. Um, you know, people are, for example, looking to hire more staff, um, which is part of working capital. And these are some of the loan products that are available that are out there. If you're looking for a line of credit, a working capital loan, if you're looking to purchase equipment, it could be heavy machinery. If you're looking to make down payment on a real estate space, um, or any kind of loan, refinancing, whatever it is. These are some of the purposes for different loan products. Uh, next slide, please. And so I wouldn't really delve much uh, into this part, but it's also important to put together a personal financial statement um, if you're looking for a loan. Um, important to know what you're, how much you're looking for. If you're looking for a real estate space, although I would imagine that real estate would not be would no longer be a priority in this sort of post COVID-19 era. If you're looking to purchase an equipment, uh, whatever it is that you're looking to do, it's very important to figure out how much do you need and why. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so these are some of the things, like I said, I'm focused on people who are looking for a loan versus someone who's looking for equity. So these are some of the things that are required if you're looking for a loan, you know, the personal guarantor, if you don't have great credit, if you have some form of collateral, it could be a house, um, whatever it is, it's important. Um, people look at your credit history, your credit score to look at your payment history, it's very important. So these are some of the things that um, we look for and we look at when it comes to uh, borrowing. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now we're going to go into the different types of capital that exists. Okay, so these are some of the individuals that you can borrow money from if you're a new business. A lot of banks do not lend to businesses that are not at least two years old. A lot of banks, regardless of where it's located, will say, show us a history of your profit and loss statement, of your cash flow statements, of your balance sheet. Usually you will not have that if you're a very new business. So how do people survive or succeed if they do not have access to capital? Some people use credit cards. Some people, they have homes. They take out the home equity um on their on their homes um some people are able to raise funds from family and friends people are bootstrapping there's a lot of sweat equity some people are join different incubator programs um for example if you're part if you're a startup and then you join an incubator program um you know those incubators could have like they give you a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars there's some incubator programs that house you that do a lot of things and they just say, go build your product and focus just on doing that. So that's one way too, you can raise capital. Although a lot of incubator programs, if they give you money like that, it's going to be an exchange for equity. Um, so what they do is they evaluate your business and then they say, you know, you can be part of our program. We'll give you hundred, two hundred thousand dollars to really focus uh, on your business. Um, other people who are blessed with such amazing networks, and I'm sure Pot of Fly also is a great community of women who are doing really amazing things. You can also borrow from family and friends as well. Um, I've had good friends who started businesses and from family and friends, they're able to get at least a million dollars. If you have that kind of network, that's really great. You don't need to go to a bank, nor do you need a loan. Um, so if you can get capital from family and friends, that's really great. Like I said, you just have to be able to communicate your vision in such a way that you can convince the other person to invest because it's difficult for people to walk away from like their retirement plans and all of that and say, wow, I'm going to give you this amount of money to go build your vision. Um, so really you have to be great at storytelling. You have to be really great at communicating what your vision is. And more importantly, you have to explain to the individual who's doing the investing what's in it for them. And then that you, go ahead. I was just going to say, Mary, I love that you highlight uh, the importance of, you know, being comfortable with storytelling and yes. being able to essentially sell your pitch. I know that a lot of folks are afraid of, of that kind of like, how do I market myself? How do I do my own PR? You know, um, oftentimes on these chats, we talk about uh, the elevator pitch. If you had like five floors and you had to, you know, pitch your, yeah. your idea to someone, what would you say, how to make it concise? And I love that also you're pairing it obviously with integrity as well. So not just, you know, saying whatever, you're, you're backing up what you're, what you're saying. Um, and I just want to extend an invite to our live callers now. Um, I know that some of you all are either starting your business or looking for funding. Um, and uh, as Mary said, you know, we do focus on building our networks here at Power to Fly. So if you want um, to share our resources as far as, you know, go to this website or, you know, there's this, you know, open call happening now, um, please drop in the chat box, you know, how you would prefer for people to reach out to you just to, you know, build our network together. Um, I like to do that live on the chat. So usually it's like for with me with LinkedIn, please, you know, feel free to connect with me in LinkedIn. Um, you can connect with Mary also on LinkedIn and, and she'll also share her information a little later. So feel free to use this chat box to drop how you would like to, you know, open your network um, live here with us. You can put the link there in the chat box. Awesome. Okay, so shall I go to the next slide, Mary? Um, yes, but I just wanted to highlight too that if you're going to be borrowing from family and friends, yes, they're your family, yes, they're your friends, there needs to be clarity on what that relationship 
on what that relationship is, because I can see there it's potentially risky to that relationship. If you don't pay the money back or if the business fails and you know, something happens. So that's also very important, but it's great to have a group of people who actually believe in you and believe in your vision. Um, so these are some, so for capital, for growing businesses, after you've, you know, prove you've proven your idea in the marketplace and you have customers and all of that. Um, a lot of people go to, you know, um, they, there's a lot of factoring options, uh, merchant cash advances, their interest rates are quite higher. Um, and the repayment terms are shorter, but there are options that are available. Um, some people can also go to CDFIs who are listed as community development financial institutions. In the US, there are different SBA loan products that are available as a business owner. Um, the 7A community advantage loans, um, you know, their credit unions. So these are some options uh, as a growing business that you can also um, be part of. Next slide, please. Uh, once again, I think uh, I mentioned this earlier as well. Um, you can also go to conventional banks. A lot of small business owners do not feel comfortable usually going to conventional banks because like I said, they focus extensively on credit. So if your credit is damaged, there's um, a likelihood you probably will not be able to receive funding from a conventional bank. If you don't have your financial statements, a lot of small business owners that I work with it's usually one person doing everything, one person doing the sales, the marketing, you know, their financials, their accountant. And so some people do not keep accurate documentation of their financials, which is very important. So if you're listening to this, now is the time to start thinking about how to keep accurate financial documentation of your business. So thinking about your profit and loss statements, your cash flow, your balance sheet statements. Um, if you don't have something, create one, work on one, hire a bookkeeper, hire an accountant, but ensure that you're able to keep accurate financial records of your business, whether you're looking for a business, uh, a loan or financing through a bank or through a personal investor, it, it, it will become very, very handy um, for you. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, next slide. I'm not sure what's on the next slide. <laughs> so just to review, um, like I said, in here in the US, because I know a lot of people are calling in from Mexico, Toronto, and everywhere else around the world, which is great, which speaks to the kind of visibility that Power to Fly has in terms of building a community, a global community. Um, so how it works is if you can go to a bank to find money for your business, do that. If you cannot go to a bank here in the US, um, there are community lenders, community development financial institutions. Sometimes their interest rates are a bit higher, but they're able to give you funding and some money to grow your business and help you get to the next level if you have your documentation. Um, and a lot of the times they're not extensively focused on credit. Credit is part of the assessment, but it's not the only thing that they look at. And then if you don't qualify for a loan um, at a CDFI, you can also visit an institutional lender, peer-to-peer um, -peer lender. There are so many of them online now. You go online, you're, you, know, you say how much you're looking for, put in your bank information, social security number. Within 48 hours, you already have money in your bank. But the in, even though they're really fast, <laughs> their interest rates are like very high, extremely high. So that's also something to consider as well. Um, if you have the networks, um, you can also raise funds from family and friend, like I said, um, or you, some people use their credit cards, whatever it is, whatever works for you. If you believe in your dream, in your vision, there's an option for you to find money for your business. So, okay. So as a small business owner, you know, something to consider is what do lenders look for? And I think that that's a very proactive approach to financing because um, in my years of working in the small business space, and like I said, I've been in the small business space since 2007, um, a lot of small business owners treat us like the emergency room. <laughs> so they, need, they needed money like yesterday and they're coming to us today, <laughs> you know? So you have to really work with them like really quickly because they're like, I need it now, you know? And they're calling you every day, every moment, you know, especially during this COVID era, working with small business, owner, small business owners and 
figuring out ways to help them grow their businesses has been really very, has been very rewarding for me as a person. So something that lenders look for, it's important. If you can write this down, what do lenders look for? What do investors look for? If you can answer that question, you will definitely be able to secure money. So these are some of the things or questions to ask yourself. You know, what's, what's the, what's, what is the history of your business? What are your personal strengths and weaknesses, as well as that of your business as well? Uh, you create a SWOT analysis, opportunities and threats. Um, are your sales growing? Do you have customers? Do you even understand your target audience? Do you understand your target customers? What do they want? How do they shop? For example, if you're in the restaurant business, you might find that during the summers or more of your higher months, and maybe during the winters or more of your slower months. So how do you compensate for that sort of sales lag, you know, when it's winter and maybe there are not a lot of people visiting your restaurant. So those are some of the things that you need to understand so that if you go out looking for a loan and you're like, okay, during my summer months, I'm doing well, but how will I be able to repay back the loan during the slower months? Those are some of the things because a lot of businesses are very seasonal. They have their high low high months and their lower um, and their slow months. Your personal credit is very important. Like I said, you know this is a global community here with the Power to Fly um, uh, platform. So some communities or countries might not even look at credit. In the U.S., credit is very very important. Um, and then you also need to figure out your reason for borrowing, and more importantly, can you pay back the debt? Next slide, please. So working on a business plan is also very, very important. Um, your business plan does not need to be 600 pages. <laughs> your business plan could be a three page business plan. Actually, um, at Columbia University, they do something called the uh, lean methodology, whereby you're creating a chart of, you know, your business, um, your customers, your sales strategy, how much it takes you to acquire, so customer acquisition, how much it takes, customer retention, how much it takes. So you should look into it. I think it's called the uh, lean methodology or so. It's like a chart. Um, you can Google it and you'll be able to see that. But some people prefer that to a business plan. But don't be intimidated by the business plan. Um, doesn't have to be 600 pages or 100 pages. It could just be, you know, five pages or less. The idea is to have a great executive summary be very concise and know your financials, and then be able to talk about sales and marketing in terms of how will you acquire customer, how you retain your customer, and more importantly, how will you sell the product? Because once you sell the product, then you're able to acquire the customer. Once you acquire the customer, what do you need to do to make that customer happy so that they stay, right? Perfect example is Amazon. Amazon is great at making customers happy. If there's an issue with your product, they're like, you can take it to any of the, I think it's FedEx stores they've partnered with or UPS. You drop the product there and you don't have to worry about it again. You get a refund from Amazon, the money's in your bank. So when you make things easy for your customers, they're more likely to stay. Um, so it's important to think about customer acquisition and retention. So when you're looking for a loan, like I said, or even sometimes some investors, some investors might request um, for these products or for these items, your business plan executive summary, very important, helps your audience or whoever is reading to, to helps them to know that you're the expert in that particular area. You've spent number of years in the industry or you've, you're planning to do something different or you're doing something different. So that's usually highlighted in the executive summary. And then how much do you need to borrow? What do you need the money for? You have personal and business tax returns. Sometimes uh, some lenders will ask for it. Your interim uh, business financials, which includes your cash flow, profit and loss statement, and your balance sheet. Some people might also look at your projections. Um, and then your personal credit. Um, here in the US, credit is very, very important, as well as your personal financial statement. Next slide, please. So like I said, and like I went over earlier, your business plan is very important. If you don't feel like putting together a business plan, don't be intimidated, like I said. Doesn't need to be 600, 700 pages. You don't even need to pay someone to do it for you. You can just put together a very concise 
five page document that explains your business because you're the expert. You're the one who understands and knows what value you plan to add to that particular space. Are you doing something different? Is it data science? Is it artificial intelligence? Is it machine learning? Whatever it is, you are the one who will be explaining how you're adding value to that specific industry and space. Explain your reason for borrowing. If you're not borrowing money from a bank, maybe you're pitching to an investor. So what do you need to say to ensure that the investor believes you? You know, you need to pitch properly. Cash flow, debt service. So I've been able to. Personal credit, like I said, um, and debt coverage ratio. Debt coverage ratio is basically understanding that do you have enough cash flow to be able to pay back your loan? So that's basically it. Next slide, please. So like I said, uh, these are some of the chapters uh, for a business plan, executive summary, company description, industry and competition to show that you know the space very well. Marketing and sales, very important. If you create a product, it can't just sit in your house. You have to sell it. <laughs> like I said, once you sell it, you acquire customer. How much does it cost you to acquire that customer? Once you acquire the customer, how much will it cost you to retain that customer? You, have, you can only retain a customer that you make happy. So those are some of the things that you think about. Your financials, like I said, your organizational management, very important. Who's on your team? It can't just be you because a lot of small business owners, especially women, are solopreneurs. So it's one person doing everything, which can get exhausting. Um, you're the accountant, you're the salesperson, you're the marketing person, you're the social media person, you're doing everything. You know, to be sustainable, you have to hand off some responsibility to someone else. So it's very important that you know how to build a solid team. And more importantly, the customer. The customer, you have to make your customer happy to be in business. So next slide, please. So I wouldn't really delve into this. I think I spoke about this already, um, putting together a business plan, look into the um, lean business methodology. I think that's what it's called. It's also a chart. It's another alternative to the uh, business plan. Um, and then your personal financial statement. I advocate for this, whether or not you're looking for a loan because it helps you to manage your personal finances and helps you deal with reality. <laughs> you know, especially here in the US where a lot of people are constantly using their credit cards to pay for everything. And even more during this time of COVID where so many people have lost their jobs, people are reliant and dependent on credit cards if they have it to pay bills, to buy food and everything. Regardless of what your situation is, I always advocate that you put together a personal financial statement. You can make it weekly, you can make it monthly, you can make it quarterly, but it's important because it helps you assess where you are financially. And you don't really have to be a millionaire to do this, but it's good to have great, um, a good grasp of where you are in terms of the cash that you have on hand. So that's very, very important. Okay, um, I wouldn't really delve much into this because like I said, the presentation uh, was created and geared towards people looking for a loan. Um, so yeah, so these are some of the things. If you're a startup, right? These are some of the things you have to consider. Your business registration, legal fees, all of that. So usually when people are looking for money, they're usually afraid to ask for what they actually need. You know, so they start off really low, but it's always good to act higher and then come down. <laughs> um, so these are some ways that uh, people raise money and things that they use the money for. If you're if you're thinking about starting a business, but I wouldn't really delve into that. Next uh, next slide, please. OK, debt service uh, co coverage. I wouldn't really delve into this either. Um, it gets really complicated. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. Basically, debt service um, ratio is basically how much cash flow do you have on hand and can you afford to pay back the loan? That's basically what it is. Credit, it's this is a global community, so I realize that it's mostly US <laughs> entrepreneurs that are affected by credit, but I always advocate 
have good credit. If you're here in the U.S., have good credit because your credit matters. Sometimes it's the first thing that people um, look at. As much as there are different um, legislation to ensure that people do not discriminate against other people who have terrible credit, in terms of lending and what people look for, it's the first thing that people look at. It's like, what's her credit? You know, before I even take it, a, take a look at her loan application. What's her credit? And usually, you know, six forty is is a good credit. So ensuring that you're paying all all of your taxes and you don't have any tax liens, ensuring that you're paying all of your bills on time, ensuring that you don't have payment delinquencies because late payments affects your credit more than anything else. So if you have like two late payments, it will probably bring your credit down to almost close to like 600 or even below 600. So if you can pay all your bills on time, um, definitely do so. Foreclosures definitely affect um, credit score. And once you have an issue on your credit, you also have to be proactive about removing things. So don't be shy and don't be afraid. Write to all the different credit agencies, TransUnion, um, Equifax, you know, um, yeah, so write to all the credit agencies. Um, don't be shy if you need to get, you know, it takes, I believe, about three months to get something off your credit if it's wrong. But if it's not wrong, it takes seven years to, to get anything off your credit. And that seven years is a long time because you could be denied various opportunities. So your credit is, is good. It's always good to take good care of your credit. Um, next slide, please. I won't really delve much. I think I already talked about that. Um, cash flow is very important in business. If you're starting out, um, very important to think about the cash flow. So that's why I advocate for if you cannot manage your day to day financials, your cash flow, your balance sheet, and your profit and loss statement, also known as your income statements, you can hire someone to do that. That someone could be a bookkeeper or a CPA if you can afford one. Um, but it's important to really assess, you know, the cash flow um, of your business. Um, next slide, please. I wouldn't just delve on, on that. Yeah, next slide. <laughs> yeah, so um, just to a brief summary, because um, I think you guys might have questions and I'd love for this to be a more interactive session. Know what you need to apply um, what you, the documents that you'll need if you're looking for a loan. Um, be very proactive and understand what the lender is looking for in an application. If you understand the lender's perspective, you are less likely to hear a no. Have a business plan. Like I said, a lot of people like to pay other people to write their business plans. Don't be intimidated by it. Your business plan does not need to be, you know, um, 100 pages, five pages, 10 pages, whatever it is. Or you can also opt for the lean business methodology as well. And then definitely understand your debt service ratio. Know how much cash you need to generate so that you can cover your debt or any kind of liabilities that you have. Um, next slide, please. Wow, so much useful information. I know that um, at least <laughs> I see people writing in the chat box, they're, they're saying that they're, you're getting so much uh, good information, very helpful. Um, and then Hannah here has written, you need a good team to be legit. Long-term is not viable with one person doing it all. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's jump right into um, your questions that you have submitted offline. Thank you, Mary, for putting together that beautiful presentation. Um, so what we'll do now is, so Mary, you know, she created that presentation especially for us. Um, she looked at some of the questions that you all have submitted offline. Um, and I mean, yeah, you were really thorough. So if we, if we pick up um, some of these questions here and you've already talked about it, feel free to dive in more or if you see your question presented on the screen and you're here now with us live, feel free to take yourself off of mute or write in the chat box. So let's go with this first question here. Uh, where can I learn how to draw up a business plan and know what information to include when applying for financial loans? Now you did talk about this a little bit um, when you mentioned um, the like uh, making it, you know, not being afraid of making it five pages or less. Um, do you have any other tips or tricks that uh, we can look for um, when creating a business plan or applying for financial loans? Yeah, so um, where can you learn? So here in the US, we have something called the Business Development Centers. 
Um, so if you walk into any small business development center, usually they're located at any university. If you're in Texas, I believe there's one at the University of Houston. If you're here in New York, there's one in Columbia. There's one, you know, so there are different business development centers. If you walk into any of those centers, they can help you with the business plan. And more importantly, that resource is free. It's something that your taxes pay for. So it's something that can help you. If you're in New York City, they have the uh, New York City Small Business Centers. Once again, that resource is free and available as well. Um, and the small business centers can also help you with your business plan. So if you go to any of the websites, whether it's the US SBA website, where there's the SBDC website, whether it's the New York City Business Solutions website, doesn't matter where you are, I believe they have templates and resources that are available for you that you can utilize. And there are also numerous platforms that, you know, offer, I think there's like bplan.org or whatever it is. You know, there are so many platforms that offer you templates. And there are some people who have made this their business where they help you write the business plan for a fee and they make it like 5,000 pages. There's nothing wrong with that, except that they don't know your business the way you do. So you should be the one writing it, which is why I try to um, separate it. Executive summary, marketing and sales, financials, industry and competition. And then, you know, what is the future? What value are you adding? It's not really complicated, but if you have a great idea and you're vested in ensuring that the idea comes to fruition, spend your time to actually write your own business plan because there's nothing more, I don't want to say frustrated, than someone giving you a business plan that they themselves has never read. <laughs> and you're like, do you know what's here? And they're like, well, I paid someone to write that, you know, that shouldn't be the story. And if, if you don't like writing business plans, I believe the lean business methodology is also something that works. It's like a chart. It's a nice chart that you can order online. And then you just answer those questions that are there. You know, and they go into like customer acquisition, customer retention, what's your sales strategy, what's your marketing strategy, which platforms are you going to be using, are you selling your business on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, is your business B2C or B2B, B2C is like business to consumer, or are you selling directly to another business, so yeah, <laughs> if you can do it awesome. yourself, definitely do it, but like I said, there are resources, SBDC, um, United States Small Business Administration, the Small Business Development Centers, New York City Business Solutions, and you can access their website anywhere and they have those resources available to you at no cost. I, I love that free, you know, free help. And then also I love that you're pointing it back to you, like make sure that it's what you want to don't, you know, just to make it easier, pay someone else. Uh, I, that's great, great advice. We have a great question here in the chat box. How can we set ourselves apart? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> well, so what makes you different? Um, I think if you're planning to add value to a particular industry, that's a question that's, I won't say it's entirely easy to answer, but that's a question you need to take time to figure out. I can't tell you how, like something that's really popular, for example, and this might be right or wrong, is for example, the event planning business, right? Uh, I remember when I first started in this space, so many people doing event planning, birthdays and weddings and, you know, oh, I can help you and all this stuff, right? And then when you look deeper, you realize that some people are doing things differently. So some people have appealed to the, for example, luxury market. What kind of value are they adding to the luxury market? If that's your space, if, if your space is the luxury market within event planning, for example, one thing you'll know is that not everyone is your customer because most people cannot afford it. So that's the first thing. Then if you say, okay, there are 20 other people doing luxury just like I am, what makes me different? It varies. Some people are doing everything from ensuring that the you know, the per the celebrant of the day does absolutely nothing and they're responsible for it. You know, um, some people are great from the planning, getting the flowers, the cake, every being really on top. So what sets you apart could be customer service. In the case of Amazon, that is the, you know, that is the experience. What sets you apart could be customer service. 
What sets you apart could be an integration of technology, how you use technology. What sets you apart could be the type of clients and customers that you're looking to get. So it really varies, right? Um, and what sets you apart could be, you know, like if you take the case of Amazon, for example, one thing they're really good at is customer experience. You know, um, you can't really get mad at them. <laughs> you know, if you return an item, for example, they refund your money immediately. There is no conversations. There is no long story. It's like, you're dissatisfied, return the item, we'll refund it. It doesn't even matter if you've even used the item before. They'll take it back. So everything can set you apart. That's something that you have to sit down to figure out. Like I said, it could be the customer experience that you plan to offer your customers. It could be your pricing. Like I gave him the example of event planning. Luxury could be what sets you apart. So your pricing could be what sets you apart. Um, technology could be what sets you apart. Now we have people utilizing data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning. That could be what sets you apart. So it really depends, but it's up to you to figure out, you know, what really sets you apart. Thank you for that response. Nice. I hope that answered your question there. Um, Nicole, that you wrote that in the chat box. Feel free to uh, drop more questions in the chat box. We've got just a little over 15 minutes left. So if you have not had a chance to speak yet, now is your time to shine. Uh, let's move on to this next question here. Um, how can I develop a game plan for my financial needs to know how much to ask to borrow whilst taking into account market fluctuations, prevention measures for disasters such as corona pandemic and quarantine? Yeah, so um, during the COVID-19 in March, April, I actually got to work on uh, the PPP loans that were available to small business owners, which is the uh, payroll protection program. Um, and I also got to work on the New York forward loans, which was created for people who did not receive PPP. And I also got to refer a lot of my clients to something called the EIDL loan, which is the economic injury disaster loans. So I worked on those three loans during the COVID. Um, and because we're in COVID, um, the interest rates are like, super low. <laughs> so for the payroll protection program, for example, the interest rate for that loan product is 1%. Where, have you heard of that before? <laughs> 1%, that's the interest rate. And not just that too, the loan is forgivable if you follow all the rules, you know, according to the US federal government. For the EIDL loan, which is the economic disaster, injury disaster loan, the interest rate is 3.75%. For the New York forward loan, the interest rate is 3%. So there are all these different loan products that became available for small business owners as a result of COVID-19. Now, the issue is people are getting these loans and they're either maxing them out because, you know, you need the money and people were shut down for like two, three months. And the other thing, the other reality is that people do not have jobs and so they cannot spend. <laughs> You know, so if you don't have a job, the last thing you're thinking about is going out to a restaurant. Now, that will definitely impact the restaurant really hard. You know what I mean? If they're not getting the extra dollars from people's paychecks. Um, in the case of New York City, there are several things that are happening. For example, you know, um, different media outlets and data shows that a lot of wealthy people are leaving the city. So all of that extra income is going with them. They're leaving, they're enrolling their kids in other areas. Um, like I said, New York City has been really, has been hit really hard as a result of the crisis because a lot of people don't have jobs. As a result, they can't pay their rent, you know, all of that. So, and the consequence of that is that it's affecting small businesses, right? The restaurants and, and all of that. So what can small businesses do? You have to get creative and innovative. Um, you know, I had a small business owner I worked with at the height of the pandemic who used to make um, watches, for example. And then when the pandemic hit, he pivoted quickly and started making masks and got contracts to supply masks to hospitals, New York City hospitals, hospitals in Texas and different things. So it's really up to the business owner and being a business owner really I'm very inspired by business owners because it's not easy. <laughs> it's really not easy. You have to be really, you have to be fast thinking and you have to be quick so that opportunities do not miss you. So you don't miss opportunities. 
Um, and so people are pivoting to other things. If you're a restaurant, Maybe you're now like delivering to people's homes, delivering to hospitals, you know, delivering to different places. So you have to really pivot. But is there financing available? Of course there is. You know, no one wants the economy to suffer. But the issue is if you go out there and you get more money, but then customers are not coming because they don't have money or jobs, then if you get more money, it doesn't really make a difference. So I think it's important that, you know, uh, entrepreneurs are very forward thinking and pivot as quickly as possible um, because that, that's going to be very, very crucial. So you need to go into industries and spaces where pe what people need, like every, everything is online now. So I can't imagine an event planner trying to or organize a physical event or like a convention, right? So they have to get really creative. What can you do? How can you work with people who are coming online? What can you do differently? Um, like I said, restaurants are now more focused on delivery, um, you know, and people are pivoting, making masks, getting contracts, doing all kinds of stuff. So um, I don't think market fluctuations is something you can prevent, but as a business owner, as a forward thinking business owner, you can definitely pivot into um, a space that works best for you. Now, what are some red flags to consider? So right now we're in COVID and, and I know you mentioned that the, you know, the, the loan service providers are giving these really, really never, never seen before low um, you know, percentages. Yeah. Um, and that might make someone go like, oh yeah, give it to me now. But what's a red flag that they, can, that, they, that they need to be aware of for kind of more of a long-term? I know that no one knows, we're all yeah. in this moment of uncertainty, yeah. but um, can you speak from, from that position? Absolutely. So. The three loans I mentioned, the PPP loan, the payroll uh, protection program loans, the New York forward loan, and the United States Small Business Administration Economic Injury Disaster Loan, they're all government loans. So they're government loan products. Now, yes, they're predatory lenders. <laughs> and I get so passionate about this because they cheat a lot of people. So people go online and they go, I am looking for a loan. And then predatory lenders come up because they pay for the SEO, they pay for the SEM and all of that stuff. And then people are like, wow, let me look at the application. Very easy. What is your name? Where do you live? And what is your bank account? You're like, wow, perfect. I like this. And the next thing, they deposit money into your account. You're like, wow, who would have thought? And then you get the interest rates. <laughs> And then the interest rates are like 70, 75%, 80%. And you're like, for a $20 loan, I'm paying back $100,000? Yeah, so, so those are the things. So predatory lenders are very easy to find. They're very accessible online, especially if you go online, because they invest so much in SEO and SEM. Some people will even go as far as calling people. You know, they have like a directory and they start calling different businesses. Do you need a loan? Do you need a loan? And there's nothing wrong with that. But the issue is you have to read the fine print, right? The, the online lending space is a multi-billion dollar industry. Like people are making money off it. But the issue comes when it comes to paying back the loan. You don't want to collect $10,000 and pay back quarter of a million, doesn't make any sense. And people get stuck with the APR fees and all kinds of fees and the interest rates. Um, and then their late fees are terrible. So God forbid you miss a payment, it just sends your account into a downward, downward spiral. And what happens too is because they have your account information, they withdraw money from your account, whether you have money in there or not. So you don't wanna owe them and then owe a bank. <laughs> that's going to be terrible, you know, especially if you don't have overdraft or, and if you have overdraft, it's like, you know, you don't want to owe your bank overdraft because it's like plus $20 or whatever it is. So be very careful. Is there a way to necessarily prevent them? Absolutely not. Because during this time of COVID, a lot of people are desperate for cash, but if you can take the, your time to research the company, go online, look at their different um, grades online. You know, if they have any kind of reviews, look at that as well. Um, preferably it's best to go to a bank or a CDFI community lender. You know, once you hear community lender, know that sometimes they're there to serve the community um, and focus on those. But if you go to online predator lender, they're very aggressive. 
Um, their sales <laughs> strategy is extremely aggressive, but you definitely pay for it with high interest rates and APR fees, which is not worth it because you spend your time focused on paying back the, the debt than growing your business because you're worried about paying back the loan and paying back this and, you know, all of that. Some people worry so much. I have clients, you know, during COVID who used to call me like 3 a.m., 4 a.m. because they're worried about their bills, you know, and sometimes some of those bills are these online predatory lenders that they got before COVID. And now the lender is taking money out of their account while their businesses are shut, you know? So just ensure that you read the fine print if, if you can, yeah. Yes, and when in doubt, listen to your intuition, right? If you Absolutely. feel weird about it, don't go for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. All right. So we've got time for just a couple more questions here. We've got about seven minutes left. So um, let's go over some of these questions. And again, if you feel like you've talked about this enough with your presentation, we can move forward to the next. Um, what financial strategies are out there and how can I pick the right strategy for my small business? Yeah, I think this is... Um a question that you have to sit with your accountant um, with because financial strategies vary based on industries. Um, and so it's going to depend on your specific industry. So I can't, I'm not sure if I can, you know, there's so many strategies out there. You have to figure out what works best for your specific industry. And now every industry must be online. <laughs> so a financial strategy for me right now would be making sure you have a website, making sure you have social media pages, making sure you're accessible online, making sure you have your online visibility, not joking around with digital marketing, SEO, SEM. I mean, financial strategy now in this era of COVID and post COVID would be having an online, having your online visibility to be very on point because that's very important because so many businesses are like, oh, I don't need a website. You know, my business is B2B or I don't need, but for two months, no one could do anything. <laughs> you know, like no one was going to any physical location. So you need a website. So I would say the strategy for any business now that we're in COVID and post COVID will be to have a digital marketing campaign and to have an online visibility, so. Awesome, I definitely agree with that. And it's as frustrating as it is, I mean, we're all in these uncertain times and you know, it kind of takes an extra effort to peel yourself off of technology because you know, maybe you can't go anywhere and maybe you're just drawn into the screen. Um, so I definitely see that as being very useful uh, for creating your financial strategy. Yeah, was there a um, lockdown in Argentina? Because there was yeah, a lockdown we, in New York for two we're almost still, two We're months. still locked down. It's okay. been, I don't know, I don't what year are we in? That's that's my response <laughs> to that. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, but we, you know, I, I, community is key. You know, I feel like another thing that I'm interested in hopefully seeing, I, I would like to see this happen um, within small businesses is just strengthening the community within right small business owners. Um, I know that you're also speaking a lot about banks and you know getting help from the government and things like that. Um, and I would I would also, you know, I'm just waiting to see like what, I, there's so much that's up in the air and that there, there has to be some sort of resolution between like shaking hands with your neighbor and saying, let's help each other out too. Absolutely. You know, like let's, let's do the other resources, but let's help each other out too. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. All right, so um, let's just maybe go through two more questions here and then we'll, we'll um, close this chat. So much beautiful information. So again, thank you, Mary, for sharing. Um, would these strategies differ based on your type of business and where your business is based across the country? Now, I know that you've mentioned, uh, you've been very um, sensitive about this being a global community here. So feel free to dive in specifically with the states since this question is about the states here. Sure. So my, my expertise is not even just, uh, you know, the States, but specifically New York. <laughs> so my professional career has mostly been in New York. So, um, I mean, in terms of strategy, like I said, I would say now, like you stated um, when you spoke earlier, is that a lot of things are up in the air as a result of COVID-19. As much as we want it to be business as usual, unfortunately, it is not. But every business on this phone call needs to have a digital marketing campaign and strategy. I cannot emphasize on that enough. You know, make sure that you're visible online, whatever it takes. Um, 
you know, yes, you know, you need to build those relationships however you can, um, because it's through relationships that we build business. Very important. If it's anything you take away from my chat today, it is through relationships that you build business. <laughs> no one builds business without relationships. So, you know, it is through relationships that we build business. And I think COVID-19 has sort of like made people think about relationships differently, right? Because when you think about building relationships, you're thinking about going to a conference, you're thinking about, you know, meeting someone in person for coffee, but well, you can't meet with them anymore because maybe the coffee shop is closed as a result of COVID-19. So how else do you get to connect with other people, whether it's other business owners, whether it's other investors, you know, how else do you build relationships with small business communities, right? Without meeting in person or physically, you know? So you have to get innovative and creative, whatever it takes, <laughs> you know? And, and I, I want you to think about it, like how reliant we had we have become on so many conventions people look forward to conventions you're going to a small business conference you're going to a small business convention you know there are conventions on plastic spoons convention on food you know those things help people build communities but we can't have conventions at least not anytime soon not for until there's a vaccine or whatever it is so um yeah focus on digital marketing strategies campaign um, and if it's anything that you take from this chat is that you only build successful business through your relationships. So how do you develop those relationships with COVID-19 constraints? That's, that's going to be <laughs> something to think yes. about. Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, um, we can obviously all identify with this, uh, with everything being up in the air. And actually, since we've just got about one minute left, just can you continue to encourage everyone during these crazy times? Um, give us some food for thought to take away uh, before we end this chat and let us know how we can stay in touch with you um, and support the work that you're doing as well. Okay, so I will type my email address in the chat. Uh, email is one of the best ways to reach me. And um, like someone said, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, my name is Mary Olashoga. Um, Encouragement. I, I love the small business space. I mean, I have been in the small business space since 2007. That's a very long time. And I've worked in every area from selling digital marketing products to selling loan products to helping minority women business communities get their certification so they can do government contracting. I've really been everywhere. So I feel like I could be my own city FI. <laughs> so... I feel like the resources I have, I'd love to use it to help people and help others, you know, really get to the next level. And I always commend small business owners because it's not easy to be a business owner. It's not easy to worry about someone else's salary when you have not paid yours. So I understand the difficulties and I'm always inspired by small business owners. Don't give up. You know, if you have a vision and you have an idea, keep going, you know, don't give up. Um, keep introducing yourself to people. And there are so many people that will say, no, I don't like the idea, it's too new. I don't understand it, I don't have time. And it, like I said, it's even more difficult because how do you connect with people with COVID-19 constraints? You're just gonna have to keep, you're going to have to keep knocking on doors, you know, um, and you know, don't give up. Akin, did you have something to say? Is he on mute? Oh. Yeah, it looks, Akin, did you want to chime in there? Uh, well, no, it's just been a great session. For me, starting out, um, you get the same feedback about, um, you know, the, you know, the business being new, yeah. um, you know, and people want to see some sort of track record. So that's always just right. a challenge. Yeah. Um, and then I see that people, um, most financiers don't, especially... Uh, banks, when you want to go the debt route, don't really do um, the service industry because it's not tangible, right? You don't have, yeah. So those are the kind of challenges that I see, um, and very few people have the knowledge assets within those um, institutions to understand um, businesses, right? So conventional businesses, yes, they'll understand, but some anything they don't understand, just like you said. Uh, I mean, they are risk averse, right? So they would rather not um, 
when you're trying to say you're incubating, you're, you're working on a story idea and you need money for development before you can go into production. Nobody yeah. has time for that, you know? Yeah, so yeah. it's always just a bit of a challenge, but this was very helpful. Yeah. Um, you know, and th there's a lot that one can apply within um, just this jurisdiction as well. Um, even though the examples are largely from America, but um, it can be applied within, within um, you know, yeah. and I can say, like the film space, to be honest, yeah. is very risky. And so if you're looking to raise money for in the film space, you either have to bootstrap, meaning do whatever you need to do on a low budget basis, use your iPhone, build a community, whatever it is, be really like an influencer, if I can say that. And then once you have some kind of product, sell that product to like private investors, because a lot of people in the film space usually get their money from private investors, right? Um, but yeah, it's really about being creative because one of the reasons, and I'll be brief, cause I know you said we have one minute, um, you know, that I know a lot of people don't respect influencers and there's a lot of jokes around influencers, you know, but to be honest, to be able to create a platform and build a following that's outside the traditional media, you should be rewarded handsomely because if you go through the traditional media, like you're reliant on BBC and CNN and all these traditional platforms, a lot of younger people have been able to build followings, right? Whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on TikTok, whether it's on Twitter and lead movements outside of traditional media. That's not easy at all. <laughs> it's not easy. And some people have been able to do that using toys to build their following, using makeup to build their following, you know, whatever it is. But as a film person, if I had any advice from you for a lender's perspective is to do something low budget, have that product, build your following and pitch private guys, because that's the only way you can do it. Because if you do like, if you did like a 10 minute low budget film using your iPhone 12 or iPhone 11 or whatever it is. And it gets a lot of reviews and you submitted that to like a film festival or something, whatever it is. And you get just one award and then you go to the award and you meet other people and then they introduce you to other, I mean, that's how you get the ball rolling, you know? It's like, you have to be unconventional, but you know, think about it in a very influencer approach. How do you build a following? How do you build and develop a product that's outside of the non-traditional space? Yes, what great feedback. I love that. Akin, feel free to reach out. Uh, can he reach out to you through LinkedIn or your email? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. He's, he's a, he's a okay. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I know that we ran over a little bit, so thank you, everyone. Um, I learned a lot. And again, you will uh, be able to rewatch this um, this recording on Power to Fly and stay tuned for our other chat and learns that we have coming up. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>